this episode of the Teach Middle East podcast, we're talking about talk with Sarah Lambert from Dubai College. We're discussing oracy in the classroom. Communication lies at the center of what takes place in every classroom. But oracy, it's not just about talking. It requires that teachers and students think carefully about the spoken language they are using. This will, of course, vary from subject to subject and among year groups. But one thing holds true. Talk is very important. Now let's talk. You are listening to the Teach Middle East podcast. Connecting, developing and empowering educators. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Teach Middle East podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So today we're talking about talk and there is nothing I like more than talking. So it looks like we're going to be in for a good time. We're discussing oracy and the oracy in the classroom with Sarah Lambert from Dubai College. I will link all her details in the show notes of the podcast so people can become more familiar with her and the work she does there with Hartness and oracy. What is oracy? Let's start basic. <laughs> yeah, let's start basic. I suppose that it's most basic, it's talk, but it's a bit more than that. And I think in some ways we need to strip back to oracy and its origins. I mean, at the moment, there's obviously a big movement for oracy and Voice 21 are doing some incredible things in the UK. But actually, oracy isn't new. I mean, talking isn't new, is it? But oracy itself goes back to the 1960s. And the term oracy was actually coined by Andrew Wilkinson in 1965. And he took the term oracy to make it sound like literacy and numeracy. So even as far back as then, there was this view, I suppose, that actually talk is as important as you know numeracy and literacy. But in the years subsequent to that, I certainly remember at school, not all of my lessons were, were oral. There wasn't that much dialogic learning going on. A lot of it was talk, sit, listen, write notes. And I think we lost it a bit. So I suppose if we wanted to define oracy, we could probably say that it's just putting an explicit focus on developing student spoken communication by developing the way they talk, what they say, how they interact and collaborate with others, and their ability to actively listen, think and respond appropriately. And I think that's an important strand of oracy is that it's not just talk. It's not just the words. It's actually how well they listen. So it's the explicit teaching of skills, I would say, rather than simply talk in the classroom. I like that. I like the fact that you talk about listening rather than it just being about talk, because what is the point of just talking if no one is actively listening to you and taking on board what you're saying? That drives me into why it's so important. I mean, think right now where we are currently. Why is oracy important? Yeah, I think this, you know, as you just said, right now, I think that's the most obvious reason. I think there are four key reasons, but I think right now the current situation makes it such an important aspect of the classroom. I mean, we, you know, our students are dealing with learning at home on their own. They're dealing with blended learning. They're dealing with social distancing and mask wearing. I mean, our connections and communications as human beings have been fractured. And they're also having to learn to communicate as we are now through distance, through a computer screen rather than having that immediacy. So I do think with the current pandemic that actually this focus on getting students talking and communicating with one another is critical. And at, at Dubai College, we're really focusing at the moment on the social and emotional side of oracy, that actually making that connection to another human being is important when some of our students are fully at home because they have to be, because they're shielding or they, you know, they've got illnesses that mean they cannot be in school. So those poor students are so isolated that that oracy and talking to one another and collaborating with their peers, I think really is important. And, and actually maybe one bonus in a kind of a slightly sounds contradictory, but one bonus is actually we're now connecting globally um, to talk. I mean, the number of Zoom calls and, and Skype calls and online webinars that you can patch into. So in some ways, the talk is flourishing digitally, but we do feel that students are just missing out on that actual sitting in a classroom face to face because they're socially distant, getting them to pivot in their chairs. How can we get that connectivity back? So I think that's one reason as an immediate reason why RSC is really important. And I think kind of now sort of stepping back as a teacher and being a bit more sort of pedagogically focused, James Britton said that 
reading and writing float on a sea of talk. And I think, again, it's just that if students can't say what they want to say, how do you expect them to express it on paper? You know, I've got two small boys and they can talk in many ways better than they can write. They're much more articulate when they're explaining what their ideas are and getting students to just draft it out. Lauren Resnick has a lovely term. She calls it first draft talk, that actually getting students to just have a go, you know, it'll come out garbled. They'll have to refine it. They'll have to clarify it orally. And the more you do that, when they then commit it to paper, it just makes much more sense because they've already had a practice. They've already drafted it out loud without that panic of committing the pencil or the ink. And they've had a go at at talking to one another. So I think the bedrock of oracy in the classroom is that it gives students that practice before they have to develop either their you know numeracy or their literacy on the page and I think also for you know for vocabulary deficit and gap practicing what they hear and practicing what they read is important as well I mean reading books with vocabulary they see it on the page but they've got to actually learn when to use that themselves contextually. And I think, again, getting that reading out loud, that fluency of talk is something that, you know, even my year sevens, we still read around the classroom. It's something that's important. My year twelves today were reading, you know, the play text, Othello, that we're doing at A-level, but they were reading it out loud and actually just hearing the sound of language as well as, as well as what they can see on the page. And I think the third, you know, the reason it's important, I would say, is kind of looking long term now, it's looking ahead to, you know, it's a buzzword, isn't it, to say the unknown future of our young people. But I think what we know to be certain is that communication skills and the ability to collaborate with other people is something that automation and technology will not replace. So actually, I feel I've got a duty as a teacher to send out students into the world who can make eye contact, who can sit around a table and listen to other people and actually respect their views and hear what they've got to say. So the World Economic Forum, they've said that that their top 10, you know, the skills needed for 2030, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, all of these skills that Oracy enhances and develops, those are the skills that are going to be needed. So I think that's you know, really important. And my final sort of personal view on kind of why it's important, and maybe this is as a woman and kind of out here in the Middle East, but I feel that it's about empowering students and actually giving them a voice, especially minority groups, especially girls, and just having them feel that they've got a right to be heard and that their voice is worth hearing. And for me, you know, I, I work in the sixth form centre at Dubai College. And for me, it's just giving those those girls, you know, it's not the boys don't have a voice, but it's the girls retreat and they're a lot more introspective and they keep their views to themselves. And I do just feel that, you know, we should be encouraging our students, all students to speak up and speak out. And so I feel that's my final, I suppose, more sort of moral imperative that actually Oracy has that place. Brilliant. While you were talking, I couldn't help but think about the fact that when you talk to teachers on a daily basis, a lot of them are not reluctant to have that level of oracy happening in the classroom Mm -hmm. because it can seem chaotic to people who are walking by or walking (laughs) in. What would you say to such a teacher? I would say let it happen. And, and this comes you know, back to actually planning for talk, explicitly planning for talk. I mean, if you are in a lesson and you simply say, right, just turn, you know, in groups of four now, just discuss, and you've left it very unstructured, you can almost guarantee that chaos will ensue because once they've done the surface task, they will start to, you know, start to digress and then they'll start chatting. And, but if you've actually given them a very tight framework, if they've got a very clear objective and it's time limited, then it's amazing at just how productive and if it's short and it's snappy and it's focused and that noise and when you go around it's amazing the things you actually hear and certainly it's hearing those students who normally if you're in a whole class setting are quiet they'll sit back and they'll let others do all the talking and they're active listeners they've taken it all in and if you ask them on the spot they can probably perfectly recount what they've heard but actually put them in those small trios and small groups and actually 
they'll talk because they have to talk because otherwise they're sort of they're breaking down and they're, they're you know peer to peer is going to be a lot more productive and it's you know the power differential isn't there they don't feel exposed as much and that's something that we're focusing on with this social and emotional strand it's just small trios pairs and trios just getting that confidence back again to kind of test out your ideas together and then feed back to the class if you're comfortable and building it up because by the time we hit the sick form and harkness you know my year 12 today 40 minutes I didn't speak I'm just in the corner listening to what they're saying and they run their own lesson now and that's a confidence that can only come through sort of building it together but you're right it's not just the risk of noise I think it's also the risk of unpredictability you know letting students talk you've no idea what's going to come out and it can be funny and it can be a bit quirky um, and my year sevens always sort of catch me sideways they, they'll come out with bonkers things but that creativity is brilliant. You know, it's not uniform. No two lessons are the same. And I think it's heartbreaking to see that, you know, I watch my boys at primary level who probably don't stop talking all day. And then they come up into year seven, they still got that energy. And then it just fizzles out as they get older. And obviously the stakes start to increase and the written work increases and the exam focus starts. And I think that's how we feel as a school that actually, you know, yes, we're an academic school and yes, the exams are important, but we want them to start to become more of a byproduct of education that actually they will do well in their exams as well as us doing oracy and metacognition and the science of learning and all the other things that we actually think are life skills that will carry on after exams have finished and gone. So, yeah, I think, you know, to teachers who are worried about the noise and kind of where it can go, I think it's taking a risk. And that's hard, isn't it? When we are the, the practitioner at the front and you might be observed, somebody might walk past. But, you know, I have my door wide open. I'm quite happy for people to come in and almost go, gosh, it's noisy in here. What's going on? It's like, well, just go and listen to that group. But, you know, that's confidence. That does come with backing yourself, I think, and I mean, it comes with confidence, but I think it also needs to come with an understanding from your school leadership on the importance of oracy, Mm -hmm. because if you are convinced of it yourself as a teacher and you're implementing oracy in your classroom, but your school leadership who are doing the walkthroughs and doing the observations, etc., don't fully grasp it and they come in and they see it. Will they appreciate it for the value it adds or will they see it as just something that you should have avoided? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That you're not controlling. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. You know, so there is that. So let's say there is a teacher who is now, because of this podcast up to this point, (laughs) is convinced that they want to, they want to pursue more RSC in their classroom. Can you suggest a starting point, an activity that could get them going? Let's put some context around it. Let's say that teacher is year six. They've just come back into school in Abu Dhabi. They haven't met their classes before. They've just met them a week and a half ago or two weeks by the time they hear this, maybe three or four weeks. And they want to embed RSC. What's one activity they can start out with? I think starting with threes, starting with very small groups so that it's something that's quite contained. Obviously, the larger you make your group, the less talk time each student gets. It dilutes a bit, you know, the more voices that need to be heard. So keeping it small is important. And three is the magic number, so to speak, simply because if you put a pair together and one student doesn't want to engage, is having a bad day, feels a bit nervous, a bit reticent, a bit shy, then that dialogue has broken down almost immediately. It's got nowhere to go. And also you can have argument if there's only two people because they'll take polar views and it's I'm right, you're wrong. Whereas if you have three, what you've suddenly done, you've just diluted it. You know, you've pulled it out of it that actually two people can talk, the third can listen, and you're more likely to get it going then. I'm a huge fan of Voice 21. I sort of, you know, beat their drum a lot. But we also, we're partnered with Oracy Cambridge and Oracy Cambridge worked with Voice 21 to create the Oracy framework. So Tell I was us a actually, bit more about Voice 21. Okay, they are the kind of the, the wing. They have a branch that's come out of School 21. And School 21 is based in Stratford in London. And it's a school that has Oracy at its core. So as they built up the school and added the students in, Oracy is everywhere. It's in every lesson. It's in every year group. Their assemblies are Oracy focused. They do a lot of 
public speaking and spoken word with the students. So they've really pioneered the new wave of oracy in the UK. And so then they developed Voice 21 as almost their training branch. And now, you know, schools across the country and in the UK have signed up to become Voice 21 schools. Throughout lockdown, so from May last year, right through to I was on a webinar with them last week, they run free webinars and they are all available online and you get masterclasses. So they will talk about how to embed oracy in your curriculum or how to use their benchmarks. They've produced teacher and school benchmarks to help you develop oracy. Um, so they have webinars on those and then they do teacher masterclasses, which is you know, your best practice being shared. So you can actually tune in and listen to three different presentations from primary and secondary schools about how Oracy has been used. So Voice 21 have produced a huge volume of materials and they're all available online. And I would say to somebody starting out to go and look at the Oracy framework, which Voice 21 and Oracy Cambridge developed, and it's got four lovely strands to it. And they've categorized the skill set into social and emotional cognitive, linguistic, and physical. And so if you're just starting out, maybe your key focus to begin with is teaching listening skills in year six, is actually teaching them to take it in turns to speak. And they produce amazing resources, which we're developing and using at my college, which are discussion roles. So each student has a focus for their talk and it comes with sentence stems so that you can actually hear, you know, you can hear them using the correct terminology almost and they're actually learning the skill through talking so for a new teacher coming to oracy i would say pick a task which is going to generate talk so it's either there's an issue there are there's going to be more than one answer to it it's not a yes no there might be two bits of evidence they need to look at or maybe you've given them a picture for them to try and decode and discuss in a little group but i would say make it structured give them a couple of questions, give them a focus to their discussion and kind of give them a role as well. Who's listening? You know, you can have a summarizer who does nothing but listen. And then at the end of the conversation, they say, well, actually, Thomas, you said, da, 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 da. and Jane, you said, da, 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 da. and then actually they're having to listen to be able to recount and you can rotate that. And basically with young students, I'd keep it to 10 minutes, short, sharp tasks. But my year sevens now are very good. They have the laminate of the discussion roles. I think Voice 21 are recalling these talk tactics now so that you don't feel you're anchored to one position. And they've got the laminates and I'll say, right, we're doing trio work now. You've got this poem. You've got these two questions. You've got 10 minutes. Think about your time. You've got five minutes per question. And I want your summarizer decide who that is today is going to tell the rest of the class what your trio decided in 10 minutes time and when they've got that accountability it's amazing how focused their talk is but they have to know what they're talking about and I do think that's important not just blindly saying right talk about it and they just sit there going I don't know what to say so vocabulary mats stems prompts trios and something short sharp focused with with a target and a task I think them knowing what the topic is obviously is key, but an easy way to do that is to build it in with whatever the topic is that you're actually doing for the subject that you're studying. And and what are your thoughts on the fact that a lot of teachers of other subjects, not your languages teachers, but your teachers of mathematics and maybe science, what are your thoughts on the fact that maybe some of them don't see the importance of RC in their lessons as much as you might do as a languages teacher. Absolutely. And that is the challenge. In a secondary school, I mean, I suppose more in primary, you teach a range of subjects. So if you're interested in RC as a teacher, you're more likely to build it across the day for your students. But you're right. When they're in secondary and they're getting very different experiences in classrooms, it's, I think, what we've really just tried to try and help our staff this half term really and, and into next term is just this focus on getting the students talking and almost activating the students to reduce the load on the teachers because we are starting to take that strain of trying to have half a class online half in front of you engaging two sets at once at the same time and actually just using the breakout rooms and and kind of letting them you know do that talking but you're right in other subjects what we have again just tried to, to work with and in fact on the Dubai Oracy Hub next week our computer science department are going to do 
a presentation because they're going to show how computer science, the perception will be sitting at a computer screen, just learning programming, but how they're bringing oracy in again to almost teach accuracy and to get that screen time away because they've come to appreciate that actually sharing ideas and spotting the errors in the programming and working together, the learning gain is higher than a teacher telling it to a student. And so we're getting there. But I think with maths as well, we're looking at Harkness in the sixth form. That's the focus of Oracy that we've been developing for the last few years. And there it's getting them on their feet, writing it on the walls, and again, verbalizing and talking through. But you're right, it doesn't seem as natural in other subjects. But it's just trying to show, again, small focused activities where they have to talk through their reasoning. They have to explain their hypothesis in science. And that students love to talk to one another. And that's not gossiping. It's just, you know, it's that risk on your own, isn't it? Two brains are better than one. And actually, they love that opportunity. So I think when they have it, they seize it. But you're right, in limited curriculum time and in subjects that are very information focused, we were talking yesterday at school about flip learning and trying to push some of that instructional content home, push that page of the textbook to the homework, let them read that at their own pace at home, and then let them come into school and actually apply that knowledge collaboratively, rather than the other way around, sitting, listening to the idea in the lesson, and then struggling at home on those equations on your own. Flip it over and talk it through together. But it, it's a learning process, absolutely. And a seed has to be sown, which we've done. And, and now it's just watching it grow and sort of flourish, really. And, and then it'll hopefully become infectious once the students are talking about other lessons and, and their skills will start to develop and feed into the other subjects automatically. Then hopefully that wave will start to carry through. But it is not a quick sell, certainly. And nothing is, is it, if it's worth anything? <laughs> Yeah, I just wondered. I, I thought of maybe my past and thinking, how would I sell Oracy to my physics department or my maths department? I'm thinking they're probably going to look at me sideways, but yeah. I do think <laughs> there's a value which kind of leads me nicely into some of the benefits. Because for me, talking by itself is just beneficial just because it helps you to express what's inside of you and to also learn from others through their expressions. So I'm sold. But for the people who aren't sold, and they want to know what effect will this have on students' attainment and progress. Have you guys looked into any of that? So we have started to, but our research to begin with, so my master's, I focused on Harkness teaching and the impact on student confidence. So I was very clear when I first started my action research was that it wasn't looking necessarily at exam results, for example, or kind of assessment outcomes, because I felt there were too many conflating factors, really, because their prior knowledge, I've only picked them up in year 12. I can't take all that credit coming through. So I wanted to look at, again, back to that social side of things. What was it going to do to their confidence? And the research results were just, it blew us away to the extent we were like, right, we're, we're pushing the heartness through the sick form. Because what came out of it was students saying that they'd come into the year, not mute, but very quiet, very reticent. They like to listen rather than take risks. But the accountability of sitting around a single table with your peers and making eye contact and everybody's prepped before they come to the lesson and everyone's sharing their ideas. I just watch students who in a traditional rose pods classroom suddenly sitting as equals around a table, they absolutely blossomed. And to see that happen, it's one of those moments of being a teacher when you just think, that's amazing. I feel actually something's happened today. And they saw it and the energy picked up. So we're happy and we're confident. Confident to say that confidence increases. And so that's one output that we've certainly noticed. What we've also seen in the humanities and in the written subjects is actually an improvement in argumentation. So the clarity of writing has improved. And I remember acutely one lesson with my year 10s where they had pre-prepared. So again, it had been a flip learning lesson. They'd read the anthology piece at home. They'd used guided questions and a PowerPoint from me that had a voiceover. So it was almost like a mini lesson, but they did it at their own pace at home in their homework slot. And then when they came in, they tackled an exam question, but they tackled it in threes. So again, they had that not on your own. You've got other people's ideas and they talked it through orally. And then it was like, right, you've now got 15 minutes. 
write that 10 mark answer. And the quality from that one piece of work was just so significantly different to the ones they'd previously been doing in their own time at home. That again, it was just that, I mean, you've always got to see it to believe it, haven't you? And I think we often say that, don't we? If you actually witness the benefit of something, you you buy in, don't you? And I just remember thinking, that's incredible. And they found that as well. They just said hearing, as you said before, hearing other people's ideas is a key thing. So measuring academic progress is something that we are now starting to look at. But again, tentatively, because I do feel that to a certain extent, written improvement in kind of scaffolding and the way they structure their writing will lead to an improvement in attainment. But again, direct cause, I think we always have to be careful, don't we? We're we're talking about human beings to say that this equals this. But certainly you'll probably see a longer answers because they've got used to developing and talking it through. Because again, a short response in the classroom, my year sevens now are very good at doing the, but why? And kind of just waiting and getting their partner to say a bit more. And then but what do you mean by that? And they've, they've started using those discussion roles to develop that language of just sitting and waiting and waiting for the student to go, oh, well, because, and that extension of the answer we're now seeing coming through on paper. Because again, as they're writing, they're thinking, oh, but I need to explain that a bit further. But being able to actually give you quantitative data, no, not yet. But you know, I think, again, we're trying to measure a skill that's very much hard to record, I think would be, you know, I can certainly measure participation. And we've been looking at that and and tracking participation levels of students. There's a fantastic app called Equity Maps that I use for Harkness. And we're training um, staff to use that in the school. And that records, you, you kind of track every time a new student speaks, you tap on them. And it web diagrams the whole lesson. So you can see where the pockets of, of dialogue were. But it does measure how long each student spoke as well as how many times. So you can then start to look at quantity and quality and start to notice that, well, maybe that student only spoke twice, but what they said was very developed. It was quite a long utterance. They gave a lot of explanation and perhaps it was of a higher quality than somebody who's quite good at just doing the quick but wise. So that child might have spoken 15 times in your lesson, but all they ever did was just throw open questions, which is a skill, but not a skill that they should only focus on. And so I think that's what we're starting to do is sort of measure the range and type of talk that students are using. To be honest, I needed no convincing, but (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm just playing advocate and saying, listen, if someone out there says, well, what is the relationship between oracy and students' achievement or progress? And, And I think you can't relate one to the other very much vertically. It just doesn't work because there are many, many factors at play. A lot of times what we tend to hear is that students are reluctant to use their voices. And my thing is, if you don't use your voice, you don't use your power, you lose your power. And so I think oracy helps you not only to develop your voice, but to also use your power as a person to think deeper before you speak and to also develop your arguments so that you are expressing truly what you want to express and also listening for what people are actually expressing. And I think it's a fantastic skill to have as they grow and as they go through life. You referenced heartness quite a bit in your talk What is Harkness? So Harkness is a pedagogy that is American by origin, and it was developed in the 1930s by Phillips Exeter Academy near Boston. And it all came about when a benefactor to the school offered a large amount of money, huge, in fact, by 1930s standards, to, as he called it, revolutionize teaching. And he wanted the sitting in rows with the monologic teacher at the front as the power figure through whom all talk went. And he wanted that thrown out the window and he asked them to come back with a proposal. Um, And initially their proposal wasn't radical enough. And when it came back, it was what he wanted. And Harkness said he wanted to map, to bring together the supervision and tutorial Oxford Cambridge experience of that dialogue with an, you know, a tutor, with a professor, but almost as equals with the boardroom experience of everybody sitting around one table. 
And that's how Hartness was born. So as a pedagogy, it involves students and their teacher sitting as equals as best you can, given they have been trained for 12 years through a school system to see you as the expert. But is more of a democratic, everybody sitting around a single table. I mean, you know, facilities allowing you could just push tables together to make one big rectangle. But the idea is that everybody can see everybody else and make eye contact. And it's just phenomenal, really. It gives autonomy to students. It teaches them to listen. It teaches them to read nonverbal cues, to read body language. And I was very fortunate that Dubai College sent me to Phillips Exeter for their Humanities Institute. I was really lucky to go and spend a week there where we were the students as teachers. We sat around the Hartness table. We had three Hartness lessons a day. We had to prep for East One. It's a flipped learning pedagogy. So you come with your notes and your annotations. You've got a big problem, a question that you're going to solve as the table. And it's over to you. And the idea is that if the teacher is at the table, so if I sit with my year 12s, I am one ninth of the conversation. I'm allowed to contribute. I'm part of that discussion, but I'm certainly not the focus point. And in the early days, it's very much about me not making eye contact. They have to make eye contact, but they will automatically sort of make their point and then look to me for validation. And it's almost denying that validation of just head down, sketching away, avoiding eye contact and, you know, just to try and get them to just unhitch slightly and kind of look to each other. And my year 12s this year are a phenomenal group. I sing their praises a lot at school and kind of to anybody who's anybody who listens to me drone on, but they now can, they just run their 40 minute discussion and, and you know, it makes it seem like the teacher does nothing. But in reality, it's the scaffolding, it's the pre-teaching and the pre-preparation that's got them to a point that the article they've read, the text they're studying, the skills and the oracy that they have developed, that they can just have the most phenomenal conversation. And I sit there once a week. I, I don't sit at the table and I just sit in the corner and I map, I track with the pencil, I draw or the, the app on the iPad, I'll track their discussion. I code what they have said individually so they can start seeing now what they are good at, using each other's names, for example, challenging ideas, pushing the discussion on, giving textual evidence. They, they kind of know we've got a rubric which they are guided by. And they now, we've you know, brought metacognition in at the end of a lesson. They self-assess themselves. They go through the rubric. And, and today, you know, it was flat. They were tired. And they actually said, do you know what? Today, the pace was awful. It was really slow. And I wonder the students went, no, it wasn't slow. We were thinking more. And it's just that maturity. And I just sit there going, wow, they've really started to teach themselves how to have productive conversations, how to not dominate, how to sit and listen and to have you saying about power. I think another powerful thing is to learn empathy and respect because it's not just about pushing yourself forward. And to hear today some of my students saying that point was brilliant. Like, what a great point you've just made. And to actually praise one another. And for another one too, it's when they say, respectfully, I disagree with you. But, you know, yes, they've kind of put that sort of semi-trite adverb in, but they genuinely are saying, no, I disagree, but they're doing it in the right manner. They're not dismissing what's been said. They've listened and they're, they're kind of, they're weighing it up and they're going, no, I disagree. And I just think that's so lovely to see 17 year olds sitting around a table, not agreeing, but accepting that other people's views are valid. And just because they disagree doesn't mean they're wrong. And I just think that is the beauty of Harkness. And yes, it lends itself very neatly to the humanities and it's easy to develop in languages and subjects where there is a lot of dialogue anyway. But again, we've got writable walls around our Harkness table. So mathematicians, they will come in and they will put up for homework. They have prepped a problem bank. And as soon as they arrive, they're disciplined. They just mark it all up on the walls. Then they sit around the table and then they just go around and discuss each other's answers. And could it have been done a different way? How else could we reach that same answer? In science, when I was at Phillips Exeter, we, as humanities teachers, had to do a science lesson as pupils. And I think we were doing diffusion. But again, we sat at the Hartness table at the beginning. We were given our problem, what we had to solve. We had to establish first what our principles were. We were just batting it around the table with terrible knowledge of science that we hadn't done for about 15 years. And then we got up, did the experiment, came back and around the table again, discussed what we had found. And did every group have the same answer? No. What variable did they have that we didn't? And it's just getting in that discussion because scientific advances come about through collaboration. 
and you get things wrong. And I think that's the other thing that Oracy, again, when you know, I said earlier about draft talk, that actually if we can make students take the risk orally, which is the biggest risk because it's public, your written work isn't seen by your peers. You know, only your teacher sees kind of the, the risks you take and the errors you make. But when you make it publicly, yes, it's hard to begin with. But if you've done that, then actually, you know, it's less scary than to commit ideas to paper because you've taken that risk and you've tested it out and you've refined it and your answer is more likely to be refined and of a higher quality as a result. Thank you. I'm a fan and it makes me think of all the rich conversations that can be had in the classroom and how can teachers within the UAE and maybe within the GCC get involved in implementing Oracy in the classroom. I know you have the Oracy hub. So tell us a little bit about that and how they can get involved. Yeah, so we're finally, finally, due to the pandemic, we're getting it off the ground next week and we'll be having our first webinar. And we are very excited to have Voice 21 coming to be our keynote. So they're going to talk for just 20 minutes, but to just give teachers out here, again, an idea of who they are, what they do and what they have to offer. And then Victory Heights Primary School are going to share their Oracy journey because we've been working with them and how they've developed Oracy throughout the school and what they've done. As I said earlier, our computer science department will then do a 10 minute practical, small, just focus. This is one example of what we do. And then our hope, our kind of plan going forwards will be, we'll run these webinars relatively regularly and encourage staff and schools to share with us. You know, there are brilliant ideas going on everywhere. And if it's just a small 10 to 15 minute presentation. It's nothing big. It's nothing overly scary, but it's just sharing one nugget of something that worked in your classroom. And that's the professional development that teachers really appreciate is something that somebody else has tested out. It's worked. It's manageable. It's not quite off the shelf. You'll need to adapt it to your own context, but it's something you can just quickly see and go and test out yourself. So that's what we're hoping it will start to foster a collaboration between schools because I do feel out here there isn't enough collaboration between schools. I think the market, the way everything works out in the UAE, it is a competitive market. And that's a shame because I think we're all working to the same goal. We've all got the same desire, one would hope, to equip our young people with the skills they need. So collaboration is something we hope to come out of it. And, you know, we're hoping it will develop into something where once we can get back face to face, it's almost, you know, an afternoon of of little short presentations and talks and people rotating and hearing different things. There's another opportunity, but depending on when this airs, it might have passed. But I was going to say, even the webinar to which you refer will have will passed. passed. <laughs> by this, yeah, this yes. will air sometime in April. So you're listening to this in, in April. Afterwards. So we'll have had our first one, but hopefully be gearing up for another one. But Voice 21 are running for the first time as well, an international Oracy leadership program. So we are actively, again, by the time this is heard, it will be underway. But those opportunities are starting where Voice21 are offering a program whereby they do five live sessions and um, training sessions again on using Oracy and embedding Oracy with a break in the middle where as a school, you would go away and practice something, try something out for a few weeks in your classroom. So that's building as well. That's been shared with the research network and and the British schools and primary network out here have been sharing that amongst schools. So we're hoping to get a range of really engaged and interested teachers involved in that and off the back of that, collaborate again and actually share ideas. So it's starting, it's in its infancy out here. There are many more hubs and networks in the UK. So we're watching, we've kind of modelled and we're going to see where it runs by that. And again, when we're back face to face, we had a Spotlight on Harkness evening all set up to go this time last year and had to pull the plug. But once we're allowed to have people back in again, we'll do the same thing. We will host a live Harkness evening where you can come and watch a short 20 minute discussion, Harkness style, hear from our students, hear from the teachers and actually again see it in action take some ideas we're very much about sharing and sort of trying to help people and I've been into Victory Heights I've been across and presented at North London Collegiate School so again just breaking down the barriers and actually working together I think because again talk let's talk about it let's actually have these conversations like we're having now and just share a few ideas and and see what works and oh no that really didn't work for me and this is why and that's the diagnosis as well and I think for any teacher starting with Oracy accepting that it goes wrong but unfortunately because Oracy is public and it's out loud when it goes wrong I think 
teachers do panic and just think, oh, I can't go there again. Whereas if we're honest, how many times do written exercises go wrong? How many times have we taught something and then we take it in and just go, I thought that was clear. I thought my instructions were really clear and they've just written on a tangent. But we don't beat ourselves up about that yet. I think I, I, I very much sort of the message I deliver at CPD sessions is have a go, reflect, tweak and have a go again, because no lesson is perfect. And don't hold yourself to a higher level of accountability for oracy. There are human beings involved and it's live. It's something you can't necessarily, unless you've recorded it, go back and listen to. It is of the moment. But I, I do feel sometimes there is there is an anxiety that actually I tried it. It didn't work. So we'll try it again. You wouldn't stop teaching a writing task just because it didn't work. But it's just an easier thing to push away and shelve, I think, which is it's something we're just trying to reinforce that it's OK to have a go and draft talk. But we're professionals, aren't we? We hold ourselves to high levels of self-accountability. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that could be one of the things we start with is a bit of oracy amongst staff. <laughs> well, do you know what? the number of times I sit in a meeting and I think we're terrible. We don't listen properly to one another. We talk over each other. In fact, I think if my year sevens were to watch a recording of some staff discussions, they would sit there going, well, that person's not listening anymore. They're doodling on their pad. They've got their phone out. We're guilty. We sit there in, in staff, whole school staff meetings, lectures, CPDs, training days. You can look around a room and who's actively engaged and who isn't. So I think we need training, I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's what I was thinking when you were saying that. I was thinking, well, let's start with the oracy among the staff and then have it trickle down to our students. And by that time, we would have been well trained and we would be in a position to train our students. Sarah, thank you so much. It's no, been enlightening. Cool. I really enjoyed our chat and yes, Oracy, let's talk more talk in schools. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Teach Middle East podcast. Visit our website, teachmiddleeast.com and follow us on social media. The links are in the show notes.